Welcome to the Breaking Muscle Podcast, where each week we seek to elevate the conversation in the health and fitness industry. I am Pete Hitzman, Managing Editor at BreakingMuscle.com and your host for today's show. In the pursuit of mastery, most coaches and trainers choose to specialize in a particular discipline, sport, or modality. But Jen Pilate took a different approach, letting her natural curiosity guide her toward a uniquely holistic understanding of the human machine. After completing her formal education with a master's degree in human movement, she went on to study a variety of systems, including postural restoration, Feldenkrais, gymnastics, natural movement, and yoga, along with traditional strength training. Along the way, she started writing about what she had learned in order to understand it better. When she found a job as a personal trainer, she landed in the perfect place to put all that knowledge to use in a business that she became passionate about. We talk about the challenges surrounding proficiency in the personal training industry and the soft skills you should look for when finding a personal trainer for yourself. Jen reveals how her own battle with chronic pain guided her exploration of human movement and how she found that for her, running is the place where she can access a mindful state. She also gives her best advice on how people can get started on the road to improved health, regardless of their background or financial resources. If you're in the Los Angeles area and would like to hear Jen explain some of her training principles in person, she's hosting a workshop on sensing, isolating, and integrating the spine on Saturday, October 14th. We'll put a link in the show notes if you'd like to attend. Finally, if you like what we bring you each week on the podcast, help us get the word out by heading over to iTunes or Stitcher and leave us a rating and a review. If you have some ideas or comments for the show, you can reach us at editorial at breakingmuscle.com. Joining us today on the Breaking Muscle podcast is one of our uh, top tier writers, I would say, Jennifer Pilati. She is a personal trainer, which is only the beginning of what she does out on the West Coast. And uh, she's here to talk about uh, kind of her background and an event she has coming up and uh, give us her worldview on what it is to be a trainer and what fitness really means to her. Jen, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today. Thank you so much, Pete, for having me. I'm excited to be here. So when you first came on board to Breaking Muscle, you freaked me out because (laughs) you started out talking about how to do handstands, and then you rolled into yoga, and then you were talking about making your squat stronger, and I was like, this lady is talking about all sorts of stuff, and I couldn't pin you down because most of the people that write for us write within a pretty narrow lane, like if they're a sandbag guy or a kettlebell guy or Olympic weightlifting coach. People specialize, right, to become the best in their fields. You are unarguably one of the best in your field, but you have not specialized. It almost seems like what? Uh, how did you become so broad? <laughs> uh, I kind of wonder if it's a matter of adult ADD. I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> I seem to get bored easily, so I study things for a while. I get really comfortable with it, and then I think, well, how could that be better? What does that lead me to? Mm-hmm. And then I move on to the next thing. And because everything sort of helps everything else, especially in a teaching environment, I find that by studying strength training and by studying yoga and by studying somatic disciplines and by studying gymnastics, I can start to help people move through ruts a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. You also have have styled yourself as an educator as much as a personal trainer. What were you a, a teacher in a former life, like a school teacher? No, but I had such a hard time figuring things out in this field on my own Mm -hmm. that one of my goals is to make it easier for everybody else. I feel like people shouldn't have to struggle as much as I did to know what I know. So if I can help people in any way get to some of the things that I've figured out sooner, then that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely something that I can identify with being self-taught in a lot of fields is – Gosh, I wish somebody would have told me all the stuff that I understand now. Um, So you went to UC Davis, got a bachelor's in exercise physiology. You went on to get a master's in human movement, which I didn't know was a possibility. I'm going to have to investigate that. What what other education have you sought in your background as you you kind of not bounced, but sort of moved from thing to thing? I definitely, when I was in graduate school, I got really interested in motor control. Mm -hmm. It for whatever reason, piqued my interest. And while I was on my summer break from graduate school, one of the professors had said, hey, you guys should check out this DVD set, Charlie Weingroff's Training Equals Rehab, Rehab Equals Training. So I watched it, and he started referring to DNS. So 
I thought, hmm, what's this DNS thing? So I researched DNS, and there was a workshop coming up in the Bay Area. So I thought, okay, I'll go study that. So I did that for a while, got what's, really into that for a moment. What's DNS? Dynamic Neuromuscular Stabilization. Oh, okay. It's based on Yonda's work in um, Upper and Lower Cross Syndrome. It's a neuromuscular technique based in Prague. So I got really into that. And then that wasn't answering all of my questions. I work with a lot of people that have chronic pain issues or that had physical limitations and couldn't necessarily do the things that all of the magazines and a lot of the information online said they should be able to do. So I was always like, well, how can I get them closer? Mm -hmm. And DNS, like I said, it answered some of my questions, but not all. So then I got really into PRI because it's sort of segued nicely from the DNS thing. And PRI And with postural restoration. Okay. And that's based on a dentist's work in Nebraska. And it looks at breathing as a mechanism to help people move more easily. Okay. Shane actually just wrote about it in his most recent Breaking Muscle piece. He did. And yeah. I, I thought, oh, it's a shout out to that. So I got really into that for a while. But that still wasn't answering all of my questions. <laughs> so then I got into natural movement, gymnastics training, and Feldenkrais. And I was studying yoga throughout all of this, but yoga was kind of this side thing that I just did on my own. And then more pieces started to come together, and I started to be able to see how I could put together programs that really helped people improve. And it got them out of pain, and they started to do really well. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of this culmination, and that's how I sort of jumped and studied thing to thing to thing. <laughs> and within all of that, I found that writing about research helped me understand things better. So I started writing blogs that were really research-based for my site, not because of graduate school, but then I graduated, but just because I found it made me a better teacher. So so they didn't make you write enough papers in graduate school, so you started writing them on your own? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> when did you decide that, that training others, I mean, you obviously had this interest and this passion in the operation of the human mechanism, but when did you decide that training other people was your thing? It fell into my lap by accident. I started off with a corporate fitness internship when I was in my undergrad. Okay. And I thought that would be a good fit for me because it would be a steady paycheck and I'd have benefits and all those things that you're sort of looking for when you graduate college. But I posted my resume online and I was hired by Pebble Beach Company to be a full-time personal trainer. Okay. So that's what brought me to the Central Coast and got me into training people. And it sort of went from there. I found that I was pretty good at it, not great at it, but I found that I liked working with people in a one-on-one -on -one environment. And as things ebbed and flowed and I sort of figured out the business aspect and went out on my own, it just sort of grew. And it became something I became really passionate about and it's something that I really love doing. And you've been very careful to communicate the lessons that you've learned as a personal trainer to other personal trainers as well. A large part of your writing has been an effort to sort of uh, raise the quality of the industry almost, which of course, I mean, at Breaking Muscle is something that we're very interested in doing as well, so you've been a good fit. How how do you view yourself in that conversation? Like, where do you, where do you want to take the personal training industry versus where it is now? I think there needs to be a higher bar. Okay. I One of the things I have a really hard time with with personal training is anyone can, not that this is a bad thing, anyone can do it. They can go online, they can take the test, within a weekend and be a certified personal trainer. But you don't know how to work with people when you do that. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say, and the yoga industry is not by any means perfect, but they require at least a 200 hour program before you can be a registered yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. And at least you're getting 200 hours of education. A personal training certification is, is very small. And again, the quality that you get with that is so low and I think it's, it breaks my heart. I work with a lot of people who have worked with other trainers they come into me and they say, oh, this trainer had me doing this and it hurt me. Or, oh, I did this in this class and it hurt me. And I'm thinking, well, that wasn't the right choice for you. I can see that. Mm -hmm. But why didn't this other trainer know that? And it's not hard. It just it takes a little bit of time and effort to learn what you're looking at. It's definitely a difficult conversation. You know, I, I had an article uh, a little while back that, you know, calm down, it's not that complicated. Like a lot of trainers and coaches – sort of put themselves on a pedestal, not not you, obviously, but a lot of trainers and coaches will put themselves on a pedestal. Well, only I can teach you this thing, and you must have this level of expertise before you can teach. On the other hand, we had a really fabulous interview with Max Shank, who is an expert, who is like the shoulder and kettlebell guy, 
And he was very honest. He's like, look, I started as a personal trainer. I didn't know anything. And I would smack the crap out of myself, is basically what he said, if I went back in time and met myself as a personal trainer. So it's, it's, it's a challenge because people have to get into a situation where they can learn those skills and gather that knowledge. And an academic setting isn't always necessarily the right answer, but neither is a $200 mail away, you know, online exam personal training session. So it is a really big challenge. And one of the things that CrossFit is fighting right now with CrossFit Inc., CrossFit in all caps, uh, fighting right now with the governing bodies of several other certification programs is is that very thing. You know, who's going to be allowed to certify people to be trainers and coaches? And it's it's a mess because there's a lot of money go- going around. And of course, the lawyers are all protecting business interests. They're not looking out for client interests. It's almost as if there needs to be a client a, a normal person representative at all of these conversations in all of these boardrooms, right? What what could be done? Is this something that you think is going to take governmental intervention, or is this something the industry can solve within itself? I believe the industry could solve it within itself, but it would require the people that want to be trainers to realize there's more to it than what you learn in a weekend or what the online certification teaches you. It requires trainers taking the time to say, okay, what do I need to do to be better? And that was one of the things I did with myself. I wanted to be the trainer that I wanted to go to. And I am really picky. So so everything I do, I do under that scope. Am I the person that I would want, am I the person that I would hire? Mm -hmm. Trainers need to look at it a little bit differently than they currently do. Sure. Sure. And that's a passion for excellence that you want out of any profession, really. Like, I mean, if you take your car to a mechanic, you want that mechanic to be, to be seeking out, you know, continuing education, as it were, um, to be the best mechanic they can be. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to solve. And I don't have, uh, I, I'm a, I tend to be a solutions guy. I don't have a solid solution for this one. Um, it, it's, I was a vocal critic and am a vocal critic of, of CrossFit Inc. for a long time. And but one of the things they do better than most is you have to go have hands-on instruction at you know at a well-orchestrated and well-rehearsed seminar. Now it is only a weekend seminar, and yes, it is in theory possible for you to go take that certification and open a gym and start beating people up. Um, <laughs> I will say that they don't encourage people to do that, but people do it. I've seen it happen. I've been in gyms where that was the case. But yeah, I, I, how how do we? I think it's going to have to be a cultural shift. I think it's going to have to be people like you and I and, and efforts like Breaking Muscle to change what people think a personal trainer should be. And that will kind of move the bar on its own. But that's a that's a long uh, a long road to hoe for sure. So you use lots and lots of tools. We've talked about all the all the background that you've all the different disciplines you've gotten into. A, a client can come to you and you're going to assess them using the all of that background. And then talk about all of the different modalities and tools and, and sort of implements that, that you would typically use on a client. Well, it depends on what's going on. If it's a standard general population client who doesn't have much in the way of, they're not coming to me because they've had low back pain for 20 years, they're not coming to me because they've had shoulder issues for the last four years, then it looks pretty standard. I mean, again, the act of training well and the act of programming well really isn't that complicated, although I will say it does help to be able to to identify patterns very quickly because even those general population clients they often have things that are that are kind of sticking them in one place they can't move a certain way you know and it's not necessarily causing them discomfort they just can't do it and that I think is limiting a person's overall ability to experience their environment in a really complete way so I'll work on that but again it's pretty pretty standard stuff you know can the person squat how does it look when the person stands up from a chair? Is that different than when a person squats and why? How does it look when a person stands on one leg? How does the person step up on a step? Are these different? Why? You know, it's things like that that I look for with just the basic general population client. And then I implement the tools that help people do those things a little more efficiently and then start to build strength and basic, you know, mobility around those things. With people that have pain, it's a lot different. You know, it's okay, what causes your pain? What positions do you know bug your pain? And then I start to look at alternatives. Well, can we do this differently so it doesn't hurt? And when people start to realize that's an option, it's like huge doors start to open for them. And sometimes it does start with the breathing. I mean, I do use the PRI stuff quite a bit. I do use the DNS stuff a fair amount. But a lot of times it's just you're standing in your heels always and you're, you have low back pain. Well, what happens if I put you in the center of your foot and I let your ribs drop? Does that feel different? 
your back pain went away, great, let's work on that today. And that'll be the cue that I'll give every single exercise. <laughs> but then the person takes it away and they can implement it, implement it into their real life. The, the foot position thing or the, the weighting of the foot thing is something that definitely resonates with me. When I was a kid, I was a, a vocalist, I was a singer. So anytime you sing, my conductor for a whole bunch of years always wanted us up on the balls of our feet because it posturally fixes some things and makes you project better. Well, when you stand like that 100% of the time, that's maybe not so good. So I you know, developed some imbalances based on that. When I started lifting, doing a lot of barbell work, it was a disaster because I was constantly on my toes. Not because I couldn't be on my heels. Like I don't have an ankle mobility problem, but I would just didn't, it didn't make sense to me to be anywhere but on my toes. So it, yeah, it's, it's definitely something I've had to be, I'm still having to fight to be aware of how I'm standing. I'll be standing in line at the airport and I'm like, oh, okay. Back, back on your heels a little bit. What Something that you touched on that's very important, and people need to look for this when they're evaluating a personal trainer. And evaluating a personal trainer is a lot like going on your first couple of dates with somebody, right? You're, you're trying them out. You're seeing what they do and if they smell funny and all those sorts of things. You're talking about how people stand up and sit down. How do they stand on one leg? How do they stand up on a step? If you're working with a trainer who doesn't or can't, make those kinds of very basic observations and assessments and extrapolate useful information from that, you're probably working with someone who may not be bad, but they may be very early in their practice. They may be very early in their their observation of human movement. So it's important to look for what you're looking for. In other words, you know, find some people who, you know, maybe aren't in your area, maybe they're online, maybe you just can't afford them because, you know, they have a, a resume a mile and a half long like you do. But look for what they're able to do and then try to find those same traits in someone who may fit your needs a little bit better. The other thing I wanted to, to touch on, on the little paragraph that you just gave me, and I've rambled on for quite a lot longer, is you're maybe the most prolific writer out there about specific body awareness. You have developed a knack for talking in depth and at length about a single joint, a single body part, a big toe. Like you can go deep on on some... It, it sounds like something very simple, but when, then you unpack it and you're like, oh, this is changing everything. You know, how you're, you have an article coming out, I believe, tomorrow, and of course this recording will be delayed, but about the ankle and feeling the position of your ankle versus just letting it be there. What spurred you to kind of look super deep on those things? It was largely realizing what I was missing in myself. So when I started, again, doing some of the neuromuscular training, the the NMT stuff is really specific about what muscles you should feel. And there's pros and cons to this. But I realized that there were lots of things. I could do things, but I didn't, couldn't necessarily feel them. And I had a lot of chronic pain at that point in time in my life. I don't need more. And when I started to really look at what I experienced and how it changed things for me, I realized that could be really beneficial for others. And then, again, because I think I have adult ADD, I would study a joint at nauseam. And I would try all of these things on myself and on my clients, and I'd get really into a body part. And I would see how it changed everything up the chain or down the chain for the person. So that was sort of how that all came to be. How often do you have a client come in who doesn't even know, to put it bluntly, how broken they are? In other words, they come in, <laughs> you know, you do the typical questionnaire, you know, does anything hurt, scale 1 to 10, point on the chart where your body hurts, and they're, they're like, I'm fine, everything works great, I'm just here to, you know, maybe get in a little better shape, and then you watch them walk or move or sit down, and you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, I've learned, my husband taught me a long time ago, and I have a face that I make, he told me I can't do that when I train. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's not good for people, I said, okay. Sure. So I, I've learned to, to kind of bring that down a bit, um, but... It's really, uh, it happens a lot. I'll, I'll bring awareness to an area that people didn't even know existed. And they'll tell me, they say, oh my gosh, this totally changed my ability to do this. And I'm feeling muscles I didn't even know I had. And I think that's, that's really gratifying for me. Mm -hmm. You know, people say that ironically. Happens. People say, oh, I didn't know I had that muscle. You'll get sore in the gym. And oh, I didn't even know I had a muscle there. But no, you probably really didn't. <laughs> if, you're, if you're turning a muscle on <laughs> and using it a lot, you know, you, you switch from two-handed kettlebell swings to a one-handed kettlebell swing. All of a sudden, you have to turn your, you have to activate your back muscles in a completely different way, and you really have to pack your shoulders down. Well, 
yeah, things are going to be sore that you didn't know you had because you've never activated those muscles before. And then the trick is the next time you do the standard variation of that movement, to still turn those muscles on so you're getting everything out of it that you can. What kind of, you mentioned you, you were in chronic pain for, for quite a while and then not. What, what was that story like? So when I was in my 20s, I did a lot of standard weightlifting, more okay. standard bodybuilding type stuff. That's actually what brought me to yoga because I was having a lot of upper trap pain, a lot of elbow pain. It's kind of standard what you see when you're overusing things in the gym. Mm -hmm. So I started doing yoga to try and balance some, some things out. And it helped a little bit, but it didn't solve the problem. But I kept doing the yoga because I felt like that was probably good for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then as I started, as I went back to graduate school and I started to study things, I, I realized that I just lacked mobility. Even though I'd been doing yoga, yo yoga has, its, again, everything has its pros and its cons, right? And the style of yoga I was doing wasn't addressing what needed to be addressed on me. Okay. A lot of the, one of the main things that helped was actually the PRI. Okay. Was getting flexion through my thoracic spine, understanding what that was like, and then the Feldenkrais completely took care of the rest of it. And as long as I stay strong, everything's great. Feldenkrais is sort of a fringe practice. It's something that those, you know, people who are in the fitness industry have heard of and at least Googled once or twice, but I would say 99% of the rest of America and the world has no idea what you're talking about. So what is Feldenkrais? <laughs> Feldenkrais is essentially lying on the floor doing very tiny motor control movements. That sounds so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, let's, Which let's... is why the fitness industry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's terrible television. You are not going to put that in a video and sell a million copies or get like five million video or views on YouTube with that. So let's let's go a little deeper. What is you know what are the what are the mechanisms there? What are you what are you trying to accomplish? You're trying to be able to feel specific joints, mm -hmm. not muscles, which is very different than some of the other techniques that I've studied. So it's can you move this joint? And can you feel how this joint interacts with the other joints? So like when I take my arm out to the side, can I feel how my shoulder blade moves towards the center of my spine to help me accommodate that? Mm -hmm. When I reach my hand towards the ceiling, can I feel how my shoulder blade moves to help me accommodate that? What happens with the rest of me when I do it? So that is what Feldenkrais is. It's a sensing feeling practice, which is a lot of where I get my sensing feeling um, aspect to what I do. It's a lot of it's based on the somatic principles. Gotcha. And what are somatic principles? Just somatic is sensing. Okay. So how do you sense where you are? It's proprioception, which is where you're at in space. Interoception, am I holding my breath while I'm doing this? Mm -hmm. Am I able to stay calm while I'm doing this? You know, how am I internally as well as, you know, physically? And one of the really good things, I might have even been the, like the second article you wrote for us, talked about mindfulness in movement. Mindfulness doesn't have to be laying on the floor. Laying on the floor is a good place to practice. And it, for me, like meditating laying flat on the floor is the hardest place to actually get into a meditative state. <laughs> <laughs> because there is so much noise in my head, I'm much. It's much easier for me when I'm running, when I'm on a bicycle. But one of the things I've taken away from writers like you and Riley Holland and a few others who have written some just beautiful, beautiful pieces for us is that pay attention all the time. You know, when you find yourself in that, you know, your heart's fluttering out of your chest, panic state. Assess yourself real quick, and once you learn to do it, you can do it pretty quick, and then use the tools to calm yourself down. So last night I'm in a bike race and I'm getting just killed because I brought my cyclocross bike, which I haven't ridden in a year. And it's like halfway through the first lap, my heart rates to the roof, and I'm just getting destroyed. I'm riding tight, and when you ride tight on dirt, you're just you're going to crash. So I did a quick check, and I'm like, oh, I need to loosen up. So I breathed into my belly a few times, and all of a sudden the trail's just flowing in front of me, and everything got a lot more comfortable. How did you arrive at that conclusion that mindfulness and motion can be tied, that mindfulness can happen in an almost chaotic environment? I think for me, well, it was partially the Feldenkrais, but it was largely running. Okay. I've been a runner since I was 16. And running for me has been like you. I don't like to lie down on the floor and meditate. I find it just painful. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. Yeah. And, and at least with Feldenkrais, you're moving around a little bit. So I can, I can use that as a restorative practice once a week. But running, I, I still run three times a week. I run trails fairly often. And I found that was the one place where my brain could quiet down a little bit. And I could actually feel what I was feeling. 
And I learned, you know, I'm going up this hill. My heart rate's elevated. I'm arching. Well, what happens if I try to breathe a little bit more calmly and I let my ribs come down? How do I move then? What do I feel? So that was kind of where the mindfulness really started to come into play for me. And I started to apply it to other physical practices. Now, do you run competitively or do you just run because you love it? I ran competitively for a while, and then at some point I decided that I just wanted to run for me. That definitely yeah. works. I, I run competitively with myself. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> One of the things that you really emphasize in your, in your videos and in your articles is precision in movement. You know, once you've developed this body awareness, and I feel like everybody going into a, to a new training modality should spend like four weeks just doing the body awareness thing, like... <laughs> figuring out what it's like to move their bodies in space and, and uh, but you focus on precise movements you know move move your finger a little bit to the right and feel how that changes your shoulder position and your handstand that kind of stuff so the real world's not like that you're going to get out of your studio with its beautiful floors and the yoga mats and you're going to go out in the real world and stuff is going to come at you sideways and you're going to go on a trail run talk about chaos how do you handle that dichotomy well ideally if you've developed and a lot of the, the videos that I do, I hope people use them as warm-ups so they have the awareness. But then when you start moving, you let go of that a lot. You know, you let go of that, especially if you're interacting with your external environment, which you should be. The awareness is still there, which is great. The mobility, hopefully, has been built up because of what you've done. And you should be able to withstand whatever stress sort of is thrown at you. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I run, for instance, I know if I start to feel my right knee, which every once in a while happens, if I change my foot strike ever so slightly, even if I'm on trails, it's going to feel better. So why wouldn't I do that? And I know how to do that because of the awareness stuff that I've done in the gym. Yeah, I, I have a, uh, a lousy right knee. It's been operated on once already, and it's probably going to have more in its life. So I've become a lot more aware of all of the things around my whole body that make that right knee feel better or worse. And it, squatting is the most profound thing. I squat okay, but if my knee tracking isn't where it ought to be, that can make a huge difference. If my hips don't send far enough back, that can make a big difference. And the thing I've been playing around with a lot lately, which was not my idea, one of my coaches gave me a two-word cue one day, and it completely changed how I thought about my squat, is grounding my whole foot instead of you know, heels, 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 right? Everybody's back in your heels. And I, I told you I struggle with staying on the balls of my feet too much all the time. Well, overcorrected, back on my heels too much all the time, <laughs> even when I deadlift. Ground your whole foot. Oh, okay. All of a sudden, you know, the knee tracking almost takes care of itself and some other some other good things happen. So all these different disciplines that you've integrated, um, what have you found that just doesn't work for you or just in general? I think everything has merit. I, I I've never gone to a workshop or studied something or watched even a YouTube of someone that's well respected and walked away saying, ah, that was worthless. You know, I think that I think that again and as humans we're such interesting individualized creatures that even if it didn't work for me, sometimes I use stuff on clients that I know doesn't work for me. You know, I tend more towards an extension pattern. So I know that I have to work a little bit more on flexion. I have clients that are much more flexion pattern. They need to work a little bit more on extension, and that's nothing wrong with that. It's totally fine. You know, so I don't think it's really that there's anything bad out there. It's just how can you apply it in a way that's useful for the person in front of you. What's what's the saying? The the mark of is it the mark of intelligence is the ability to hold an idea and not accept it or something like that. There's a there's a much more eloquent way of saying that, but it, yeah, definitely. So you're also a, like a voracious reader. You're posting all the time, and I, I get it. I am too. Like I have so many books around my house in various stages of reading. Some of them are because I'm, you know, doing stuff for breaking muscle. Some of them are because I need something to read that doesn't have anything to do with fitness. What are you reading right now? I am reading *The Gene* by Siddhartha Mukherjee. I'm not going to say his name right, and it's wonderful and big, and it's going to take me forever. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have like an I have like an anxiety feeling when I get one of those big books because I know that I'm going to love it and it's going to be 1800 pages of awesome but then while I'm reading that 1800 pages my my stack of things I have yet to read just keeps getting taller. No, totally. I actually bought it because I was out of things to read and oh. I needed something that would last me a while. 
Man, I have not had that problem in a long time. There are literally five books stacked on top of each other in various stages of having been read on my nightstand, and that's just my nightstand. <laughs> then we get to my coffee table, my dining room table. It's a mess. It's a mess. So you talked about all this stuff that you've fixed and solved and discovered. Like, do you have anything left to work on, or are you, like, already the perfect human mover? It seems like you've got all oh, these... No. You've got all these great <laughs> things going on. No, I definitely, there's I, there's always stuff to work on. And I know for me, again, we all have our things, right? I have a tendency towards stiffness, believe it or not. Mm. Um, so I work a lot on mobility. And I write a lot about mobility because that's always been a sticking point for me. It's, it's going to be something that's going to be a lifelong thing, especially I'm a type A person. So when life gets to be a certain way, I tend to kind of tighten back up. So it's just a constant, it's just a constant lesson for me. How can I relax? How can I find the movement? And, you know, everybody has strength they can work on. Everybody has imbalances. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you have, like, you know, performance goals, like specific things you're shooting at right now? Not really. I'm doing a pretty well-rounded program right now, which has been really fun, and it's been really different from what I was doing. I had knocked off a lot of – I haven't been doing much resistance training in the last couple of years. So I hired a coach, and I've been doing quite a bit more of that, which has been really good. And I'm still doing a lot of the body weight type stuff just because I love it. But definitely building up some strength in a different way has been good. What's the uh, what's the new obsession? You've you've gone from uh, <laughs> you've gone from your your master's in human movement to yoga to you've got TRX and GMB on your resume now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. I mean, it's. It's pretty. It's very rare that you find somebody with that broad of a base. What is your? What's it, what's the shiny that that's attracting you now? I actually, I've been kind of waiting to see what catches my attention. Sure. I think I might do movement archery with Tom Thomas Wexler. He's a European based mover. He does a lot of improv type stuff, and it looks interesting. And I think improv is is a fascinating. Thing. I read Alan Alda's book recently, which is, I can't remember the name of it, so I'm on my nightstand, but it was about how improv can make us more empathi empathetic human beings, mm -hmm. and I, that was really fascinating, and improv is very hard for me, so I feel like learning some more of that could be really beneficial. Yeah, improv is not even a thing that I can contemplate. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely the rule follower, like, you know, oh, here's how you do the movement. You put the thing over your head, and then you put it back down. And, yeah, it, it's it's funny. I Like, watching people dance, even, is just mystifying to me. I can't, I mean, it might as well be, like, rocket surgery. I can't, I can't even contemplate how you go out and just invent human shapes that way. I'll close with a question that might take you a very long time to answer, and that's why I put it at the end. Mount Rushmore fell down, and uh, a future government has decided that our priority as a country moving forward is going to be health and fitness, and so the new Mount Rushmore that we're erecting is going to have four faces on it about health and fitness, and they're coming to you for an answer. Who are we putting on the new Mount Rushmore? Oh, man, that's hard. Well, I feel like John Berardi from Precision Nutrition is doing some amazing things. Really? So is. I feel like he should be one of the faces because he's talking about nutrition in a really accessible way. And I think that's a something that a lot of Americans struggle with. What is your yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna derail you already. What's your uh, nutrition philosophy if you if you have one? Eat food not too much, mostly plants. I will totally quote Michael Pollan on this. <laughs> That always made sense to me, so that's kind of it. I'm pretty much vegan. Once in a while, I throw some chicken in there. Eat food that grows on the ground, walked on it, flew through the air, or swam in the sea. I think Walt yes. Dory said that once, and it's like, oh, it kind of solves a lot of problems there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, head number two on uh, Mount Rushmore. Who's up? I'd probably put Dr. Adams. He was one of my professors at UC Davis on there. He's in his 80s now, but he's so passionate about Americans moving more, mm -hmm. that I think he would be a good fit. So that's number two. While you're you thinking, I'm going to derail more? you again. <laughs> I'm going to throw you another curveball in the middle of your thought process. Getting Americans <laughs> moving again. This is something I've been thinking about, well, like daily, because I'm the editor of the website. So I feel like one of the biggest impediments is the financial barrier to entry to fitness, right? 
Like if you're going to go be a cyclist, you're going to invest thousands of dollars. If Even if you're going to go be a runner, you're going to spend hundreds of dollars on shoes every year. If you're going to do CrossFit, my gosh, is that expensive, or weightlifting, or even yoga, which is pretty cheap, but it's, I mean, it adds up, you know, because then you got to get the mat, and you got to have the clothes, and you got to do all the stuff. How do we change that? Is there a way to introduce fitness? Because you can do a lot with body weight, right? You can do a lot with, you know, gym equipment that's at the playground, but nobody has sort of the aptitude or the desire or the understanding to go out. So how do we how do we change that conversation? I think letting people know that just going for a walk is going to do them a whole lot more good than sitting on the couch. I feel like people get overwhelmed because they go online, they research, how do I get in shape? And there's all of this information. And then they're like, oh my goodness, how am I going to strength train three days a week, do my mobility twice a week, get my cardio in five days a week, make all my healthy food? How am I going to do this? There's just not enough time. And then they, it just, so they just falls away. So what I always tell my clients, because clients come in with various goals, is if they fire me, that's fine, but walk. Mm -hmm. Just walk. Because that alone, being outside, the research behind being outside is huge. Go outside. Go be by the trees. You're going to feel better. Walk for 20 minutes. You're going to feel better. And from there, slowly, change starts to happen. I think we get too fixated on how can I do so much. So I think starting the conversation there needs to be a little bit louder and a little bit more prevalent in what people find in terms of information. And then, again, slowly, you know, can you do these three really easy exercises every day? You know, make them make one a stretch, one sort of body weight, and one just kind of a moving around exercise. So people get into that habit, and it only takes them five minutes. And they're like, "Okay, this is okay. This I can handle this." And then slowly, instead of trying to force feed people all of this information, <laughs> and it, it is so much information. It's kind of one of the curses of a of a culture that has so much access to so much luxury and leisure is that we've really developed our sports and games and human performance stuff and specialized it out so much that there's just a lot of information out there and if you want to be literally any kind of athlete you could spend your entire life studying that and still only know 10 percent of what's out there but for most people for the you know 33 percent of americans or whatever it is that are that are currently morbidly obese you just move get up move around a, a bunch of years ago when my wife and i were both significantly heavier than we are now we got a puppy and that was all it took. Like we both lost 20 pounds in like six weeks because we had to walk the puppy because our puppy was very high energy. We had to walk him all the time. So we all of a sudden were walking, both of us, three or four or five miles a day. And we just fell off. It, you know, it was shocking. And now, now, having come full circle, running all the time and lifting and doing CrossFit and riding the bikes and, you know, chasing all this stuff. And then you get these cranky little injuries and you're like, oh, I'm not walking very much. <laughs> Totally. It's such yeah. a good restorative practice, and yeah. very few people talk about it or do it. And it's hard now. So here's a challenge for the the uh, recreational athlete, as most of us are. How do you make time to walk that much? Because I've got 10 hours of work to do every day, and then I come home and I have four more hours of breaking muscle to do every day, and I'm trying to cram in one hour of training. And that right. one hour I could walk, but I'm going to be – I won't be bored because I'll listen to a podcast, but I'm going to be like just not stimulated in the same way that if I went to CrossFit and beat myself to death for an hour. What are we supposed to do to balance that? I have dogs, so I walk for half an hour every day. I usually do it on my lunch break. I feel like there's a lot of value. Again, I'm a big get outside person. There's a lot of value in getting outside on your lunch break. It Well, at least for me. It, it frees up my mind for a moment. I'm out of the studio. I have a trail right behind my studio. I know not everybody's that lucky. Mm -hmm. And I can just go and check out the hills and just be for a moment. I, then I come back to the studio and eat, and that takes care of that. But I think if people can figure out ways like that to get it in, because everyone's busy. I totally get that. But even things like parking your car further away, which is that silly advice that's given so often, and people are like, ah, whatever. But if you park 10 minutes away from where you're going, you've suddenly done 20 minutes worth of walking, mm -hmm. you know? So it doesn't have to be as hard as we make it. <laughs> I, I didn't invent this phrase, but I use it all the time. And if somebody knows who first said this, tell me so I can give them credit. But movement snacks, little movement snacks. Like all the time, anytime you get a chance, get whatever movement you can get. And I think part of it is to not obsess over 
having a perfect workout. Not obsess over being on a plan that's regimented and you're going to do this. Not obsess over the data even. You know, I had Andy Galpin and Phil White both on the podcast and um, their whole thing is stop quantifying things that just aren't useful to quantify. Stop worrying about how many steps you're getting in. Just get some steps, just some, like as many as you can fit in, as many times a day as you can fit them in. So I'm working on that. I, I, I do the parking far away thing, A, because I hate hunting for a parking spot. <laughs> it's just, it's the biggest waste of human existence ever. And B, because I need that extra movement every day. You know, it's the irony of the fitness professional. You know, you set a desk <laughs> for a lot of your day <laughs> typing and reading stuff online. All right, so you've got two more heads to put on Mount Rushmore. Oh, I wasn't going to let you off. <laughs> Let's go Jack LaLanne. Jack LaLanne, all right. Yeah, because again, he did. He inspired so many housewives in the 50s and got women moving, and I think that's incredible. That's huge, especially was, for that era. Yeah, such a male, male thing at that time. Right. So that was cool. So we'll go Jack LaLanne. Who carries Jack uh, LaLanne's torch today? I don't know. Who would you say? I can't come up with anyone. that. I'm tempted to say Greg Glassman, and I'm not his biggest fan, but you can't deny what he's done, like what he started. He's changed the conversation for a whole bunch of people, and especially women. There's, I think the biggest thing that's happening in CrossFit right now is women's empowerment. Look how strong she is rather than, you know, look how pretty she is. Look, she's pretty too, but look what she can, she can do a hundred pull-ups in two minutes. Like <laughs> That's the incredible thing anymore instead of, you know, how she looks in uh, way too little clothing. So yeah, I would, I think maybe Greg Glassman. See that. Yeah. All right. Last head. You got one more. Oh, okay. I'm going to say nobody will have ever heard of her, but Mabel Todd, she wrote The Thinking Body. Okay. Which was published in... I want to say the 30s or 40s. Wow. And she she was the first, my first exposure to somatic principles. Okay. She talks about pain. She talks about how what you're feeling as you move can be changed so that you can change your experience. Hmm. And again, that was powerful for me. It's a book I still refer to often. And way ahead of its time, it sounds like. I mean, that's... Way ahead of its time. There's so much coming out now. I feel like the, the most harmful person in the history of health and fitness is probably Rene, whose last name I can't pronounce, Descartes, Descartes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I always say it wrong. The Cartesian theory of mind-body separation is the dumbest thing that's ever happened to us as a species because now we're finding out how you move influences your gut biome, which changes your emotional state, which alters your thinking. Like... It really is all connected. Oh, and by the way, your gut biome is millions of independent little organisms that are all fighting each other and helping you digest your food and sending you chemical signals. Like, you're not even a single organism. <laughs> you're a whole bunch of different organisms all operating in symbiosis. You, you aren't really as in charge as you think you are if you aren't, you know, shaping that environment by giving yourself the, the physical movement and giving yourself the proper nutrition and all those things. Is that something that you dive into with your clients, or is that like sort of if, if somebody's been with you for a couple of years, then you have that talk? I My clients laugh because they'll ask me for diet advice, and I say, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just stay far. I, I, I've made it very clear to my clients. What I've studied is movement. You know, I know a little bit about some of that stuff, but not enough to make any sort of educated statement regarding it. Well, I, I think like we were talking about, it's that basic advice of eat food, Yes. And don't eat things that aren't food and, uh, you know, try to get not too much of it. Don't eat until you're cross-eyed every day and uh, then move as much as physically possible um, with varying levels of, of intensity and as many planes and with as many different implements as you can get your hands on. So you've got a workshop coming up in L.A. Talk about that. It's a four-hour workshop on sensing, feeling, and integrating movements of the spine. So we are going to cover from the head to the tailbone. I'm excited. It's a topic I'm really passionate about. I, Again, because I, I had low back pain and because I've worked with a lot of people with low back pain, I love to share what I've learned and hopefully help people kind of see that area in a different way. So that's that'll be that, yeah. So you mean that the spine is not meant to just hold still and be rigid <laughs> in a, and then you just move it up and down in a straight line, right? That's not... I feel like yeah, that's, that's what we were supposed to do. That's what they all told us in gym class is keep your back straight. Keep your back straight. Always. Yes. yes. And yeah. never turn. 
at all times and in all situations. Keep your back perfectly straight. Never mind that the spine itself is a curve. Just keep it straight anyway. <laughs> <laughs> very rigid, exactly. <laughs> yeah, very rigid. So if you're in the L.A. area or if you're not in the L.A. area, buy a plane ticket and fly to the L.A. area. Come to, come to her uh, workshop. I almost said open house. It's definitely a workshop. <laughs> it's at 360 Fit House in L.A. Uh, there is a link on her website. We'll put a link in the show notes. Jen, thank you so much for your time. This has been hugely fun and informative, and uh, we'll have to do it again. All right. Thank you, Pete.